out parking tickets and leave me alone. Stick to something you know about. Listen, my daughter was about your age. Then she met a guy like you. Now she's dead. <laughs> you still believe in ghosts, P-Brain. He's a closet. Don't hurt me, please. Don't keep me waiting for those onions, Herman. This is all the whiskey you possess? Everyone out of the way of the bulldozer. Hello and welcome to Hello, This is the Doom Show. I am Richard. Folks, this is a very exciting time for me. I am joined by Simon. Hello, Simon. Daddy? Come to daddy. Come <laughs> to daddy. Ah, that's Aphex Twin, everybody. How relevant. All right, I'll, I guess I'll talk normal. I, I don't want to, but whatever. It's 2022, y'all. I can change my voice. I'll do the whole show like this. Oh, man, Simon, I can't wait to talk about the Black Coat's daughter with you in just a few minutes. While you got your voice pitched there as well, you have to sing the song. <laughs> Come to daddy. <laughs> ah. um, there's probably more lyrics to Come to daddy, but I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> a scream at the end will do. Ah. All right, we lost everybody, so now we can talk about a movie. <laughs> Folks, we are talking about The Black Coat's Daughter from 2015. This is a movie that um, came out, <laughs> and I almost saw it in the theater, dude. I had a chance. Right. Yeah, I should ask you about that. I uh, didn't know what the hell it was, had no clue, and it was playing in the theaters. And instead of just buying a ticket and just getting off my lazy butt and going, I was like, meh. And then I saw, you know, I am the pretty thing that lives in the house mm. and had to backtrack to find this one. And I was watching this and I went, <laughs> oops. <laughs> yeah, big oops, definitely. Wh whoopsie doodle dandy. Um, what is hindsight though? <clears throat> hindsight is 56. 20. It's 420 blazer. <laughs> you know what, you know what hindsight is, Simon? <laughs> hindsight is A24, brother. <laughs> <laughs> Oh boy! So we could talk about A twenty four real quick. So they make they make the movies, they buy things and distribute some movies, and I don't know more about them other than uh, a lot of horror fans hate A twenty four. The entire yeah. studio, the entire anything they are going to release, these people hate it, and I love it. <laughs> it's like, oh darn! Can you imagine if there was like artsy horror movies that came out? Or weird passion projects that were, like, funded by 25 different, um, like, they had to source money from, like, 25 different production companies. Oh, man, wouldn't that mm. suck? Yeah. So, yeah, I have no patience for people who just hate A24. <laughs> it's like, no. No, I just, I, you'd remind me, there's some, I'm just looking briefly on Google Images, there's some A24 memes, unsurprisingly, uh, the semi summit a bit. This, what's this, the A24 starter pack? What's on this? Uh, let's have a look. Oh boy. An A-lister with non-actor, neon blue and pink, shaky cam, violins in score, never seen him in a role like this before, sad <laughs> kids, pricey merch, and hip young director. Ooh, well, yeah, that, the, we got a hip young director. We got one of the weirdest freaking dudes ever. <laughs> <laughs> I love seeing interviews with uh, good old Oz Perkins, uh, oh, he, yeah. or Osgood Perkins, son of the late, great Anthony Perkins. Mm-hmm. And his brother is also weird as shit. Frickin' Elvis. <laughs> his brother Elvis, who does the music for this movie, is very strange. Oh, man. I'm just trying to imagine. They're just their dad as well. It's what it would have been like being in that household. Uh, yeah, that was it's, really it's, a dull moment. It's weird. Just weird stuff. I love it. But, you know, mm. it inspired... Well, you know, folks, we plan to cover uh, this film. Eventually, we'll talk about it. And then there's I Am the Pretty Thing That Lives in the House. And then eventually, we'll get around to uh, Gretel and Hansel. Mm. And... The two movies, the first two that he's done, his feature-length films, are um, very much about his dad yeah. or his relationship with both of his parents and everything. So it's, it's really interesting to me. Mm. Um, mm. <laughs> but yeah, let's talk about Black House Daughter, a.k.a. February. Folks, there's that first R, February. Don't forget about it. <laughs> People were trying to get rid of it, Simon. People were trying to actually just call it February. <laughs> and I'm like, no, don't do that. That's uh, not like an uh, an American thing, is it? 
you know, like your vowels. What did oh. I say to, oh, I've made this joke before, they said to Brad, he said, what did you do with all the vowels? Do you throw them in the harbour with all the tea as well or something? <laughs> it's like, too many vowels, you Dude, crazy British people. how dare you? Are you still <laughs> mad about that? You British people and your tea. Jeez. Yeah, still, still bought her. <laughs> That's okay, I'm still mad about, you took our queen away. Uh, Can I have her back? What's his name? <laughs> uh, who's the who's the show? Who's the host of that show? Graham Norton. Oh, right. Yeah. Give him back. <laughs> he, he was never ours. I I, I like him. He's he's yeah. Graham Norton. Anyway, I'm losing it. I'm totally losing <laughs> it. Uh, here's the trailer for Black Coat's daughter. While I spiral out of control. <laughs> test to see if her head matched the body. Hey, Dad, just calling to see where you and Mom are, if you're coming. Worst case, they come on Friday and everyone goes home and has a really nice break. After all, we can't let you live here. You do know about the sisters, don't you? They worship the devil. Is there something wrong? Why are you doing this? Do you believe in God, John? Ever tried to look for him? I look for him in the unlikely things that happen. Little coincidences. Funny. You smiled a little. Funny. No. Why? I mean, I just wish you could stay and see my performance. That's all. Okay, I'm I'm sure you guys enjoyed some dialogue from the movie and also sounds, but uh, yeah. I've got the Blu-ray here. Um, it is from the Blu-ray of my shelves. So here's the plot from the back of the Blu-ray right now. Beautiful and haunted Joan, Emma Roberts, makes a bloody but determined pilgrimage across a frozen landscape toward a prestigious all-girls prep school, comma, where Rose, Lucy Boynton, and Kat, Kiernan Shipka, find themselves stranded after their parents mysteriously fail to retrieve them for winter break. As Joan gets closer, Rose watches in horror while Kat suffers terrifying visions and becomes possessed by an unseen force. Wow. Yeah. Oh, by the way, spoiler alert. Yeah, folks, we're going to talk about the the thing that drives people bananas with this movie, which uh, I was very excited to watch again and yeah. think about. Like, okay, all right, we'll get into it. Uh, this takes place at the Bramford School, and we've got a, a, a lady named Cat, a young lady named Cat, played by Kiernan Shipka, as previously discussed in the plot of this Blu-ray log line. I guess I didn't read the log line. <laughs> now we get an opening song where there's uh, lyrics about the Black Coat's daughter. So mm. we're going to go ahead and say that the Black Coat in this title and in the song is the devil. Yep. Or at least a demon, at the very least. It's a demonic guy or lady. Uh, but we we immediately see um, our friend here, Kat, having a dream where um, she's walking with who we think is her father, mm. and he's showing her a wrecked car. And uh, she's very, very disturbed. 
think until unless I'm like misremembering, I think I was that focused on the red car and just the general weird vibe of that that I barely even noticed the guy in the black coat yep. until maybe <laughs> yesterday. And uh, I also just realised that you don't see the head either, do you? Nope, never do. Obviously, never it makes do. sense, but obviously has another uh, kind of uh, resonance, I guess. Yeah. The thing I've learned from the audio commentary was uh, apparently her outfit, which is the most color you're going to see in this movie, yeah, uh, is uh, based on Madeline or Madeline. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, oh, okay. Kind of unexpected influence. One of yeah, I was looking that up, yeah. and I was like, "Do I know what that is?" And yeah, I remember they made a movie out of it. I think maybe back in the nineties. Yes. Um, I need to do this. I need to do. Okay, so Madeline is what I thought it was. It's the story yeah. of this girl who is orphaned and going to uh, hang out with some some nuns, and she says, <laughs> "I don't want none yet of this bullshit." <laughs> but yeah, it's a big convoluted book. But apparently, it's. Uh, very popular and has inspired many um iterations of the same thing and, and inspired yeah. our guy osgood perkins to reference it and make me confused no it, it seems like the sort of odd thing that would influence him just thinking not getting ahead but to like this and his next two films you know how they have um kind of what well, you get in this as well a bit of a kind of literary quality almost i guess yeah oh yeah absolutely um and each one of them seems to feel like you know, like, well, each one seems like they're separated in chapters. Yeah. You know, where it's more, it's more obvious with this one and with I Am The Pretty Thing. I think maybe, does Gretel and Hansel have titles? Like chapter I titles? I cannot remember. I've only Probably seen not. one. Um, you yeah, know I really can't remember. We're going to find out when we talk about it <laughs> in 30 months or whenever we get to it. <laughs> but, uh, so... She seems to know deep down that something horrible has happened to her parents. Now, yeah. I don't, don't understand why these girls at this girls' school get February break. I mm. don't know what the fuck <laughs> happens in February that is a break. Is that a thing? I don't even know. It might um, be here. It's like I can tell I'm getting old now when I'm always like complaining when I see more kids about in town because <laughs> it's extra busy when I'm working. Oh, God. It's like, have these kids ever in fucking school? I am. Uh, February half term. Yeah. I work at a college, so I never mm. not think about freaking dumbass kids because <laughs> <laughs> they never stop being children ever. Mm. Uh, but anyway, she's, she's meeting with uh, this priest. Um, this is. Where yeah, I, yeah, Fa Father Brian. Father Greg, Brian, played Greg by Elwand. Greg Elwand. Mm, there's a great little uh, scintillating story on the commentary about that guy. Did you, did you catch that? No, I, I, did, I, I did not listen to very over. much of the commentary. Well, basically, the premiere of Toronto, uh, he brought uh, Oscar Perkins a loaf of bread, which then he said, you know, obviously had to carry around all night. Not that he was complaining, said it was grey bread, but I just thought, oh, well, that's that was nice. <laughs> He's just tearing pieces of it and passing it to everyone. That's brilliant. <laughs> By the way, that bread was soaked in LSD. Oh. <laughs> I hate when that happens. Oh, so so he's uh, he's talking to our pal Catherine. He seems very concerned about her, uh, mm -hmm. mainly because she's a goddamn weirdo. Yeah. <laughs> she's very stoic and very haunted looking. But then while he's talking to her about her parents coming to get her, like – she starts to smirk a little bit mm -hmm. and he's like, is something funny? And she's like, why? He's like, you're smiling. She's like, no, I wasn't. It's like, Oh God. <laughs> there was another weird little detail. I didn't notice until it was pointed out to me on the commentary that uh, the empty chair next to her, even yes. though I know she looks, kind of looks to the right and you presume, you know, the, right. the devils, it could just be moving around, you know, it's like, yeah, I'm just going to kind of creep behind, uh, the padre and now i'm gonna sit down you know whatever but um yeah he said the um you know you were saying this um i'm the pretty thing that lives in the house a kind of about um i guess somewhat exercising his grief for his parents yeah. the the empty chair thing it's kind of there's there's a lot of these again odd details in this of like things in the um in the production design which can have all these odd little resonances you saying, you know so I presume you went to therapy for it that you have um like empty chair yes sort of counseling you know you'll talk to somebody who should be in it and all that so yeah that's like when Clint Eastwood Clint Eastwood did that to Obama <laughs> <laughs> he talked to the chair 
<laughs> so cute. Oh man, how did I what forget a, about that? What a cutie. Uh, so, <laughs> and then he, then he pulled out uh, pockets full of circus peanuts and just started eating them, <laughs> sobbing. I, I wasn't there, so I can't confirm that last part. <laughs> then we get the best entrance of a character ever. We get this full-on amazing entrance. Uh, this yes. is Rose, played by Lucy Boynton, who uh, we'll see again in uh, I Am the Pretty Thing That Lives in the House. Mm -hmm. I always forget that's her because, you know, God forbid an actor or an actress changes their appearance and I'm completely dumbfounded. Oh, who I was, is, it completely threw me off. Who is that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I believe I've seen uh, this actress in some uh, British mystery shows. I'm pretty sure she was in some... Either Poirot or she was in a, one of the Agatha Christie. Oh, maybe it was Father Brown. I remember her from. I'm not sure. Uh, one yeah, of those. Yeah. You British people and your mystery loving asses. I just love oh, wow. your. I just love your asses. <laughs> but <laughs> she comes. Yeah. She comes strutting in for picture day, mm. and she sits in front of this beautiful blue, uh, fake cloud background. Yeah. And she flashes the greatest, fakest. I don't give a fuck about anything but i can fake it smiles mm. ever it's so good it's brilliant and now it's like sort of uh picked up again and expanded later yes you know, exactly. i think quite late in the movie it's just perfect oh my god uh but let me tell you about rose she's fucking mm. sick bro <laughs> she's pretending to be sick she's like oh got a little something in my throat <laughs> oh my god <laughs> but what she's got she's full of babies oh my god Should we see her talking to a friend or a frenemy. I don't know what the relationship is. But she's talking to her about this uh, guy that got her pregnant and her friend. I like the, the friend's like, he should take care of it. It's his problem. And Rose is like, dude, I was there too. <laughs> she's like, I literally let him lick my elbows, which is how I got babies now. <laughs> well, that's how that works. So school's letting out for this this mysterious February break, which I promise I'm not going to complain about anymore. I mean, I want I want a break in February. We see a shot of all the girls just funneling out of this school, just walking down this path. But there's one who's going the opposite door direction of everybody else. And that's uh, our pal Kat, a.k.a. Catherine. And yeah, she's always alone. Mm. Uh, is she? Well, oh, you know, you know, <laughs> I know. Uh, <laughs> she's always alone in her not being possessed by Satan. <laughs> so uh, we see her at the talent show. And uh, I always think about... <laughs> I always think about Greece too, and <laughs> that screenshot I took where freaking Michelle Pfeiffer's going talent show. <laughs> uh, but she's playing a song, and she looks out at the empty seats where her parents should be, and she's just barely getting through this song, which apparently our pal uh, Elvis Perkins, the composer, wrote for her to play. Mm. Miss Shipka, of course, can sing and play piano. Almost as good as me, bro. <laughs> Come to daddy. <laughs> to daddy. Ah! I'm going to stop doing that. <laughs> no, maybe, maybe next episode I'll stop. <laughs> <laughs> After this, this wonderful, depressing song that she gets through. Um, so her parents are MIA, or as we know, we know they were, they're KIA. They were killed in action, brother. <laughs> they're not POWs. And then um, Rose's parents are not coming to get her because she just straight up lied to them about when break actually starts. Yeah. So now they're stuck together. And boy, did they make fast friends. <laughs> no, it's really awkward. <laughs> Rose is kind of a stuck up asshole. <laughs> but she's got issues. She's, got, she's full of babies. Oh, yeah, definitely. Definitely an odd couple. We, we, miss, we missed a trick by not having a long-running sitcom with those, I think. Oh, boy. <laughs> Season seven. This is great. <laughs> uh, we get the Crooked Spoon, which I think is the true villain of the film. Oh, man. Yeah, there's... What did he say on... I've written some quotes from the commentary. What did he say? <laughs> um, I hope I get to the right page here, and I can relate to this kind of having... <laughs> like OCD and stuff. Not so much for stuff like that, but anyway... That's when you know you're going crazy and everything's going downhill when you feel compelled to straighten cutlery. It's like, yeah, that's just <laughs> Satan is definitely taking possession then. Because you expect her to be hallucinating in this moment because of the horror mm. in her eyes as she's looking down at the table and then they reveal it's just crooked spoon, dude. 
Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so that night, the two girls are alone in the school. Uh, Rose has a bit of an attitude problem. Um, she She's like, I'm going out and you better not fucking rat me out. I'm leaving. And uh, Kat, this is, man, the tension in these scenes mm. is palpable, dude. And, f- of course, we find out later why they're so tense. But uh, <laughs> Rose is telling her about the sisters so the, who are supposed to be caring for, you know, looking out for Rose and Kat. These two sisters who who live on the grounds. Uh, she says, well, you know, they're bald, right? They have no hair. And even their eyebrows are fake. They wear wigs. And one time, this girl who who goes to school here, uh, but she doesn't go anymore, so you can't ask her to verify the story, uh, she saw them worshipping Satan. <laughs> and I'm like, I didn't know where the story was going the first time I saw this. I'm like, okay, they're worshipping Satan. Like, <laughs> I was like, are they lovers? <laughs> No, it's just such a, a kind of mindfuck to lay on this uh, obviously already clearly disturbed young girl before she yes. leaves her. You yep. know, just see all details, say having no hair, made me think of the, um, you know, the witches, you know, when they all take the wigs off. and. Uh, mm-hmm. Oh, man. Yeah. yeah. You're doomed! You're doomed! Sorry. <laughs> I, I love that performance, man. Angelica Houston mm. is the coolest, sexiest freaking freak Yes. In that movie, she just undulates with evil Definitely. in that. Like, literally, it's so incredible. Mm-hmm. Anyway. Totally. So, uh, you know, our pal Cat immediately starts snooping in Rose's room as soon as she's gone, even though she told her not to. <laughs> and she's just, like, going through all her stuff and really, really, really obsessing over that picture, that picture of her. From the uh, from taken earlier, that's like the real like thing that she's oh, man. stroking it, and, uh, <laughs> stroking the picture, just the picture. <laughs> and again, there's a, a detail I would have never noticed until he pointed out in the commentary of she, I think she runs a thumbnail, you know, like below below her neck. Oh, nice! Yeah, li- literally the devils in the details. I think with this one, hey, really come on! <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Nineteen minutes in, we meet Joan, and this is where the movie. Asks a lot of our our viewers, our, our viewers. Mm. I didn't make this movie um, <laughs> of its viewers, and it is uh, this is uh, our pal Emma Roberts. Oh my God, Emma Roberts is so hot right now. <laughs> Love Emma Roberts. She can do no wrong. Mm. Uh, she she is playing Joan, and she's headed to good old Bramford, and we get uh, some nice flashbacks. She's just got out of the mental hospital. We see her receiving some medication and seeing some patients freaking out and just doctors standing over, etc. Uh, but she holds up her hand in this hallway and she's got two quarters. These quarters are important. And she tries to call someone, but no one answers. The, fo- the line, the, uh, the phone number has been disconnected. But uh, then we meet our, our, our nicey nice people, uh, Bill and Linda. And this is uh, James, is it James Remar? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. Yes, uh, yes uh, James Remar and Lauren Holly. Um, James Remar, of course, amazing actor. Love him. Lauren Holly is very important to me <laughs> because of all the thousands of hours Lietta and I spent watching NCIS, where she played the director of NCIS and frickin' had an affair with uh, Leroy Jethro Gibbs when they were younger and they have all these flashbacks of when they were lovers. Yeah. And the thing about NCIS folks, if you've never watched it before, it is the most insulting show to your intelligence. They assume everyone watching the show has never seen a crime investigation show. So they're really careful to explain what's going on. And if you're just tuning in to character dynamics, they always drop a little something to help you remember or get the know of this character of who they are. And her thing with the main guy was they had an affair. Good God. It's so obnoxious. Rewatching that shit. (laughs) Bless her heart. And then he is always like doing this crooked smile, kind of reminding her that he's thinking about them boning (laughs) back in the day. And it's like, well, number one, None of those characters would survive 
um, human resources. These are all like sexually freaking inappropriate. Oh my God, that show. Folks, don't, don't watch. Don't watch it. Don't, just don't. But anyway, I love Lauren Holly, and um, she's not pleased with her husband in this movie because he's trying to help out mm. um, our pal Joan because Joan is sitting there in the cold. By the way, everything in this movie is frozen. Oh God, yeah. Um, I think they said it was like minus 40 or something while they were filming. <sighs> yeah, they made this in uh, Ottawa, I think. Yeah. And they picked a place that was statistically more likely to have snow all the time because it was very important that they have snow. <laughs> there was a bit in the commentary where, and I just more I think about this, and I, I think um, I was reading an interview with Osgood, and he says his uh, father, which I can definitely see from bits of Psycho 2, for instance, had a bit of an odd sense of humor. And he says about the snow, he says, oh, it's actually Parmesan cheese. <laughs> what? Like, are, you, are you fucking trolling me or what? <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. Uh, I really like in the behind the scenes clip where yeah. one of the, the, like the sound guy has fucking ice in his beard. Yes. I'm like, yes. oh my God. It's like, okay, first of all, are you drooling? <laughs> it's so cold out here. <laughs> but uh, good old James Remar, AKA Bill offers to help. And uh, we see him just get Joan in the car. And as they're driving away, he has this Bramford sticker, so he's going to the school. Yeah, does the sticker have the, um, I forget what you call it, you know, the logo that's on their uh, um, uniforms as well, which again, I did not notice until he's pointed out to me that it's that it's a head, appropriately enough. Oh, nice. No, I didn't notice that. That's great. Mm, and there's also, uh, there's some Latin, again, I don't know if it's on the bumper sticker, but on the uh, said logo, which there's, it's Latin, but apparently it translates to she bows down. Ooh, yeah, that's cool. That's that's fucked up, dude. Yeah, it's creepy. Isn't <laughs> I it? love it. So uh, we see Rose and her baby daddy um, hanging out, having a very obtuse conversation. And the gist of it is that he is relieved that she's mm. getting an abortion, um, but he's upset because she doesn't seem to need him and for anything yeah. at all. Like, no, don't need you. Uh, Send this this like so many bit scenario saying about. Um, you know how this was written that it was kind of a case of less is more you know we're not going to be really melodramatic and have them just like you know spilling out everything that's happening you know so much of it is just told and the performance is like unspoken yep. or just little like an odd word you know like um after um i think just before she's getting out of the car and he's like oh be careful and she's like yeah be careful you know like oh too late motherfucker <laughs> <You know? laughs> they say in filmmaking show don't tell yeah. And I say, I'll show you yours if you show me mine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so she goes in the school and uh, immediately starts hearing noises from below in the uh, the radiators, like the heaters. She can hear some noises coming from the basement. And uh, for some reason, she checks it out. And she's headed downstairs. And we cut to Joan in the motel room. And uh, she's... Uh, getting undressed, getting to shower, getting taking a shower, and we see that she has a scar on her shoulder, and we have a memory of her with uh, she sees a priest, probably Father Brian, and mm. then uh, a police officer is shooting. So we know that she's been shot at some point. Yeah, like I think it was a bit earlier, wasn't that these little flashes, you know, especially on the first viewing, just um, just enough to kind of, you know, especially if you're not, as I don't think I was first time I watched it, I was probably watching it in uh, it's like 420 blazing it all the time, still <laughs> back then. So I think some, you know, those details were definitely kind of lost on me and I was more just, you know, just take it, just taken in by the, by the atmosphere really and the, oh, just, yeah. you know, the weird vibe and the rest of it. Mm. But yeah, it's all there. You know, they say it's like, I think again, in that little promotional feature, you know, it's, it's a bit like a puzzle where there's all these little clues and especially on a re repeat viewings, you know, really it's all there and it all comes together. This is a rich film. This has yeah. got lots of lovely layers to it, which I feel like I'm just quoting the, the awful behind the scenes feature at <laughs> like, like uh, someone's like, Oh, this movie's not just a horror movie. It's got lots of layers. And I'm like, yeah, dude. You you can just imagine those A twenty four haters seeing that and just absolutely screaming at the screen. Here's what you do with A twenty four: either don't watch any of their stuff, or you just pick and choose. Because I've not seen everything they've put out. Good lord, it's so many movies. But no. I would say ninety nine percent of the things I've checked out from them, I've enjoyed. Yeah, 
even everyone's favorite, um, uh, It Comes at Night. I still need to see that. It's really good. It, it mm-hmm. also is – I. it is absolutely true. They marketed it as a very different film than it is. Yeah. Very different. But I was glad that it was different than what I thought it was going to be, and it haunted me. Mm. Very subtly, could not stop thinking about it for a long time. Doesn't have a lot of rewatchability. No. That's about the only thing I'd say is like, it's like, yeah, I got it. Got it. Anyway. Yeah. 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 Bill is having a nice little conversation with, with Joan. Like, do you believe in God, Joan? And she's like, nah, dog, I don't. And then he talks about where he sees God, like not in the church and not in the Bible and not in the songs. He sees it in the little coincidences that, uh, that just seem to happen like a kismet and stuff like that. Simonicity. And, yes. <laughs> yes. And uh, he's not going to be the, uh, he's not going to benefit from <laughs> these little coincidences. It's going to prove the devil's real. Yeah. There's, uh, and I was going to make a, uh, in this scene, we, t- we talked about the music briefly already, haven't we? And, um, but also, you know, coupled to that, there's a lot of really creepy sort of ambience and sound design. Oh and there's God. a bit in this, in this scene. And I was primed for this because I'd watched, I had um, the 4K Mulholland Drive that I'd watched the night oh. before. And there's a there's a bit of like very Lynchian sound design in this motel scene, you know, well, again, like you see the tension in a lot of these scenes of things unsaid and, you know, the subtext and all that. It's really, really disquieting. Um, oh, and a bit before that, I'd make a comment. You know, she's hearing the voice through the, the radiator from the boiler downstairs. And we can think of the fucking lady, lady in the radiator in her razor oh, head now. Oh, shit. No, I think yes. About it. <laughs> yes. The, the thing I liked about this movie was in this scene, because she's – just got out of the shower and she's wrapping the towel and he's visiting her at three in the morning, apparently. Yeah. <clears throat> there is an, an uncomfortable sexual tension, but then it's Definitely, not, yeah. uh, there's no, they, he's not there to like be tempted or, or um, make a pass at her or anything. It's just, it's just there, but that's not who he is. He's a genuinely yeah. good person. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, n- I never got anything more than kind of you know, this like paternal concern from him at all. And uh, again, you know, the commentary, I would have not put this up, but he says, and she has to kind of acknowledge, I suppose, you know, she's just been in the shower and they're in a motel. You know, saying you can't help but not be influenced by, you know, who you are, who you're related to, and just movies in general. So it's, it's, it's kind of like Psycho in reverse, but without oh, obviously, nice. you know, the, you know. Dude, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. I'm glad you got that. That's great. Thanks. Um, we cut back to Rose and Catherine. They're having this conversation and Rose is like, she found, oh, I didn't talk about where she, because we see what she was doing in the basement, right? We've already seen it. Yes. yes Rose, uh, okay. So my yeah, bad. I, I, so. yeah. I dropped the, I dropped that. Sorry, folks. Oh, no, um, so yeah, when, when Rose went down to check out the sounds in the basement, a very pivotal scene, she finds Kat on her, on her knees, worshiping the, the freaking boiler. The, the boiler mm. was like burning hot. And one of my favorite shots in the whole freaking movie is Rose's eyes looking through that nasty freaking window, mm. seeing what she's seeing. And so I guess she's – Kat was sort of like comatose – or not comatose. She was sort of like in a fugue state or something, and Rose had to help her back upstairs. Yeah, she asked, so you, you were – what, you were, you were sleepwalking or, you know, do you sleepwalk? Yeah. And at this point, you know, she can barely get anything out of cash. She just says, and I think she repeats this later, says, you smell pretty. To which, yes. Oh. you know, the re- reply is understandable. It's like, yeah, you should just go to bed. Yeah. Like, I can't deal with this. I'm going. I would be like, I do? Thank you. Let's <laughs> hang out, brother. She gets Kat back into bed and, and Kat is like, just telling, like, just blaming Rose for her little misadventure here. She's like, Mr. Gordon said you're supposed to look out for me. Mm-hmm. Like, oh boy. Oh boy. It's all so freaking like tense and creepy and just like, man. Um, but then she says the line that chills me to the bone, mm-hmm. dude. Where mm-hmm. she's like, Is there anything else I can get you? And Kat answers, No, you had your chance. <laughs> it's like, oh no. <laughs> and it makes you wonder though, because you know, knowing how this film ends, like, what if she had been kinder to her? Or is it even possible for her to have avoided her eventual fate? You know, like, it's really interesting what all the, the possible, like, meanings of that, you know? Yeah, definitely. And I was just looking up Mr. Gordon, the guy who plays Dean of the school. 
Mm. And he looks so familiar to me, but it's not who I think it is. This is uh, Peter James Hayworth. Yeah. And I can't tell you who I was mixing him up with, but yeah, it's I was Holy expecting shit. I was expecting to see like two thousand credits, but it's not the guy I'm thinking of. Yeah, he doesn't even have a. Um, oh, it's kind of sad. Doesn't even have a, a profile picture on IMDb. Yeah. But um, yeah, there was something that jumped out at me here, and I was like, "What the fuck is this?" Total Recall 2017, <laughs> 1999, where he plays distraught man. You're you're reading my mind, dude. I was totally <laughs> yeah. like, "What?" So yes, um, 1999, 44 minutes, the Total Recall TV series. Oh my word! Uh, Twenty. They made twenty-two episodes of this shit. Oh my how lord! Did, how did I not know about this? <laughs> All I can think about from Total Recall is the guy going "Recall, Recall, Recall." <laughs> <laughs> that was a movie my parents bought me on tape when I was a kid, and I proceeded to watch it mm. sixty thousand times. I never oh. need to sit through that movie again, ever. Oh no! I, well, now I understand. Yeah, I love it. Don't get me wrong, mm. but yeah, I, I got it. I got it. It's all imprinted on your on your brain now for everything. Oh my god! It starts at my butt crack, goes right up into my brain. Been the PK dick to have you for last. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, PK dick. <laughs> Excuse me, my name is Philip K. Richard. <laughs> Whatever, dude. <laughs> I'm an idiot. Uh, Rose wisely, after this exchange with her pal, uh, she goes back to her room and immediately barricades the door so she oh, can get some yeah, sleep. Uh, we see Bill and Joan at the restaurant now, and uh, he uh, busts out his dead daughter's picture while they're waiting to order some food. Mm. And she immediately runs off to the bathroom and has the creepiest moment. Instead of like going to the bathroom to puke, which, trust me, folks, there's enough puking in this movie for many movies. Definitely. Uh, but she she runs to the bathroom and just lets out the freaking weirdest laugh. No, oh, it's, it's, it's just so perfect. And oh, it? it's boy. like just the, again, you know, coincidence, you know, synchronicity, simonicity, whatever you want to fucking mm -hmm. call it. It's like the opposite of fucking Providence. It's just so fucked yep. that, you know, it would have, fate would have brought all these people back together. You because, know, of time. course, um, our, our the picture, the girl in the picture is, of course, Rose. Yeah. Um, who's like, hmm, how does Joan know Rose? I wonder. <laughs> uh, so while she's in the bathroom, she has another flashback, and we find out that she killed Joan. Um, her name is not Joan. Uh, she Joan was a nurse that worked at this uh, this mental hospital and was she murdered her and took her clothes and took her ID and, and bailed. We have a scene where uh, they're waiting to or or Linda, the wife, is in the car with Joan and they're waiting on a good old Bill to come back, and she's like, "What did he tell you about our daughter?" Does he say we have a daughter? And does this mm -hmm. whole thing, this this freaking monologue is incredible. Oh, Lauren, yeah. Lauren yeah. Hawley's really good. <laughs> yeah, you know, they were saying that they really, I think they had like zero rehearsal time and, you know, they just had to sort of do this and, you know, sort of develop as it went along. But I think he was saying, Osgood was saying that she or somebody in her family had had a bereavement where he was speaking about somebody's mother saying, you know, it, it just completely changed her. She was just a different person then. And that kind of makes sense why she's kind of, you can tell this has happened with her. She's kind of off and I think rightfully kind of a bit suspicious of Joan of Strokat, of course. you know? Um, yeah, it was just brilliant. Oh, and again, another little thing I had never noticed, but from the commentary was saying, yeah, Lauren Holly, I don't think she ever gets out of the car yes. in this movie. And they, they joked, just saying, does she even have legs? <laughs> like maybe there's a wheelchair in the back? <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. Hey, she, even at half a woman, she's all woman. Yeah. I don't know what that meant. <laughs> yeah, and she talks about seeing her daughter at the store after after her daughter has died she just saw someone who looked just like her and it's one of the most haunting things is her talking about just seeing her daughter like a random doppelganger of her daughter somewhere yeah and just again i was just told and performed and all this and the writing you know in this is it's just really um it does paint a picture of that was he saying after that because the husband he'd been saying you know he's kind of the opposite of like you know, seeing his daughter and all these girls, he's trying to 
help out. Whereas, and this is another really creepy line that she says at the end of I think this monologue yes. saying, you know, it's strange. I can't see you at all. Oh my God. You know, it's just like this complete void there Ooh. now or something, which. Man, that's messed up, dude. Mm, mm. <laughs> well, I'm going to stop this file. So... When you're into the latest fashions, you know what bad thing drinks We cut back to Rose and Cat, and she's talking about how. Oh, oh God, man, I, I feel like we're. Uh, I'm relearning how to ride a fucking bicycle. Good lord. <laughs> this has been a crazy. I'm so like I feel like weird. This is fun. I'm glad we're getting back into this shit. Oh, it's just plot man. It's like a pretzel or something, you know. It's Oh my god. Yeah. This is this is what happens when you don't record for like <clears throat> let's see, July, August, September, October, November, December. <laughs> Seven months. Seven months. It's not good. We'll we'll do it more often. And with greater frequency. Wait. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that just reminded me. I don't know why of a completely mind blowing bit of trivia for uh, for this movie. Yes. Um, this will sort of make sense in a minute, hopefully, or it might not. But fuck it. Uh, but fuck it. Um, <laughs> That's the second T translate on the audio. I think it did. Little in joke. Um, uh, here we go. So yeah, and uh, I should tell you first, Italy, as well. Seven out of four people found this interesting on IMDb. Did you know this is Emma Roberts' second horror film debut? Her second debut, huh? <laughs> yeah. Someone actually wrote that. Somebody actually wrote that. You know that you know what you'd get with a debut, right? Um, you, don't, you don't get another one, you fucking idiots. <laughs> so not like if you're the queen, you get a second birthday. That's right. The queen gets a girth day. <laughs> mm. So Rose and Cat are talking, and our pal Cat just got off the phone, mm. which, you know, we all know that's a direct line to the devil. <laughs> We're both fucked then. But she's like, he says I can live here. Oh, really? <laughs> that's cool, dude. <laughs> <laughs> And this, again, many myriad details I would have not picked up on, it says in the commentary of how she's really, like, taking everything everybody says to her, like, really kind of seriously on a kind of twisted way. Yeah, You know, and this totally. seems to be, you know, one more example of that. Oh, my God, it's so good. So they're having dinner with the sisters. So Rose and Kat are, are chilling with the sisses, the, you know, the, the devil worshippers. <laughs> And they're saying grace before the meal, and that's when the sisters notice that Kat isn't saying the words. They get mad at her and ask her to say the words, and she tries, <laughs> God bless her, she tries to say the words, and then she just stands up, and is this when she calls her a bad word? Oh, no, that, it's a bit later. That's, that's I think that's okay. after this, but yeah. <laughs> they wish she'd said a bad word. Instead of <laughs> being able to say grace, she just vomits. Uh, she praises Ralph <laughs> instead of God. Um, and I'm like, girl, you got to lay off the lime sherbet. <laughs> do you guys have a? Do you guys have lime sherbet over there in the UK? Uh, I've had sherbet. I don't know whether it was lime. Oh, you'd know. Because if you oh, tried right, to... If you, if you tried to say grace, it'd be all over the table. <laughs> it's one of the, it's not like a, a puking scene that makes me feel nasty or anything like, like, you know, when it, someone is too good of an actor when they're puking and you really feel like the actor mm. might almost be making themselves throw up for real. It's just the consistency <laughs> of this puke is so nightmarish. Like, woo. It's just, it's weird. And he said it was meant to look like milk or like mother's milk. Again, there's all these like motifs of, you know, yes. like motherhood and, you know, various things swirling around. So, so apparently mother's milk is bright green. <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> yeah. They, they have her, uh, they're checking her out in, in the, the little uh, nurse's office there. And that's when she calls her a rhymes with bunt. And uh, it's just the way that Kiernan Shipka looks. Mm. 
She is so freaking creepy, dude. Those, the makeup is excellent. They've got that black circles around her eyes going and she's waxy. She looks like just disgusting, but it's the yeah. way she stares at people, dude. Oh my God. It's, it's really unsettling. I mean, there's so many good, I think all the performances in this movie are really outstanding, but I totally. think she might steal it really. Yeah, absolutely. You know. uh, the, the sisters get a phone call and they immediately tell Rose to go out and shovel the snow of the driveway. <laughs> Which I thought was really funny. <laughs> oh yeah, she's. Which even says it's like it's not me, you know, not me who called you. A see you next Tuesday, you know. <laughs> I don't know. If I've heard that one before. Have you not? <laughs> see you next Tuesday. <laughs> I'm just waiting for the opportunity to drop it in everyday conversation, like to a you know <laughs> shitty customer or something. It's like, all right, see you next Tuesday. It's like, what? What day is it? Oh my god! Like, folks at home. Let's take up a freaking collection. Let's get Simon out of retail. <laughs> yes, <laughs> like, please. Let's just, we'll just do a Patreon so you don't have to <laughs> fucking work there anymore. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. <laughs> oh, my God. Anyway, folks, that was my first page of notes. Congratulations. You all made it this far. Oh, it's my first page of notes as well. Wow. NSYNC. Wow. Oh, yes. We are totally a boy band. <laughs> So Rose is out there shoveling snow, and she hears some keyboard music, like some old timey organ uh, music. Yeah, I was going to ask you about this. What um, is this like organ or synth or something? Well, There's a bit earlier as well that sounds very similar. Yes, I think it's probably knowing the weirdness of our composer, good old Elvis yes. Perkins. My guess is that it's a real uh, Hammond style organ. They come with a mm. lot of different ways to modulate the sound yeah so you can kind of get those weird warbles and like a tremolo or a, a vibrato effect on it uh, uh, but it's yeah. also possible that it's just a synthesizer that's trying to replicate one of those which makes it sound even weirder yeah yeah so just how everything's treated and how all the instruments like synths and traditional stuff's blurred it's really anybody's guess but oh, that yeah. I love the whole soundtrack, but that little cue is kind of like spooky, but sort of cheerful. Or like they said yes. about the end song as well, they were going for something that's kind of childish, but satanic, you know, looking at you oh boards of Canada. God. Oh boy. Um, yeah. <laughs> Music really does have the rights to children. <laughs> yes. Or whatever. Uh, so <laughs> she just gives up. Rose is like, well, fuck this. I'm leaving. And she goes back to her, the dorms. And then uh, Mr. Gordon and a cop arrives. They get into the house, and there's this great, uh, like, 180 pan where they're showing the whole house from the inside. And they don't show anything graphic. All they show is one splash of blood. And yeah. then right when they show that splash of blood, that's when these two gentlemen walk in and they react to something horrifying, which we're not shown. Yeah. Oh, it's so perfect. And now we get to see Cat's story. We flash back way back mm. to when Cat... It meets her horny lover, the, the the titular daughter is she of the black coatness. Oh, I better write that one down. Sorry, folks. We're gonna do a little game this episode where we have alternate titles for the black coat's daughter. Probably should have hyped that at the beginning. Yeah, I'm gonna have to uh, brush up my improv comedy skills because. Um, I I've not written any down, but I'll, oh, no, I'll, try, okay. and, uh, I'll, I'll try and wing it. Oh, you're going to wang it. You're going to wang Chung tonight, <laughs> brother. Okay, I got it. <laughs> My brain said, start writing. I'll think of it. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's in my fucking mind. I'm totally, I'm totally full of demons and babies. Oh, man. It's, it's, oh, yeah, I think we're in the, the right headspace for <laughs> trying to tackle this or oh, not. Speaking of babies, <laughs> BTW, friends of the show, Marky Karloff mm. and Carrie Frankenstein, literally just announced that they're pregnant again. So there's going to be oh, wow. another Karloffian child. That's their legal name, by the way, folks. They changed <laughs> their name to Karloff. That is a real thing. That is commitment <laughs> right there. That is just, uh, oh, man. I tip my heart. I really do. Dude, I mean, like having your name changed in the States, this is for Simon's edification, very mm. difficult. Do you know how many forms I had to fill out to get to mm. be Richard Glenn Schmidt? I mean, wow. 
Well, I don't know, like at least three to have the triple barrel name. I don't know. <laughs> triple barrel. That would just be, that would be too neat, really, wouldn't it? Yeah. yeah. Hey, people called me dick shit in high school. That was <laughs> fucking great. Oh, sorry. I shouldn't laugh. No, you should. It's fucking hilarious. <laughs> so we see Kat. Um, she, uh, uh, so we see Kat. Um, she's taking a bath. And, of course, the cloaked figure is there watching her. And it's always been with her. Mm. It seems like slowly creeping into her life. It, it makes its presence known, especially when her parents are dead. That's when it really kind of takes over. I was trying to figure out the moment where it really kind of shifts. I mean, I know right from the off you have the dream, but it seems to me things really escalate after, you know, there's all the really creepy phone calls. Yes, she she tries to call home. We see the shot, the connecting shot, with instead of Joan holding the two quarters... We've got um, Kat holding them, and she tries to call home. And it's very garbled, but it sounds like someone says, she's like, Mommy? Dad? Is that? Are you there? And you hear this voice just go, I'm here. Yeah. Again, oh, it's all just so like, like some of the vocals on the soundtrack is really kind of ambiguous and obviously been oh, treated. And there was a bit of trivia here about, and um, Osgood said he prefaced this by saying he might be getting himself in trouble with a union or something. So I guess this guy was uncredited. The guy on the phone, he says, is somebody called Paul Jasmine, who is one of three people in Psycho who voiced Mother. Oh my God, that's so cool. It's perfect. Isn't it? oh, isn't it great when you have a family friend like that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's when this is when the music just goes completely bananas. And this, I wrote in my notes that man, Cat is as messed up as the score for this film. <laughs> it's wild. Yeah. So we see her. She sees the beast, this this demonic beast. When Rose was telling her about the the sisters worshiping Satan, mm -hmm. um, she wasn't really paying attention to Rose. She was looking over her shoulder at the horny creature in the freaking room, <laughs> which is basically a a big cloak a mask and horns that come out of the top and then they just drained all the color out of it so it's just this black mass you can't make out any details on this thing yeah they were saying she built this thing the uh, costume designer saying it was a bit like the shark in jaws of saying you know they had it but then had to really try and not show it you know apart from you know like corner of your eye or reflected hey. off like the towels in the bathroom and that's somewhere. that's the thing that's so that's always better anyway so definitely definitely um we flash to her killing the sisters. So she has stabbed the sisters, and then she starts to cut their heads off. We don't really see what she's doing. We just kind of get the impression. And then we cut back to Rose and the photograph, the way we were introduced to Rose, where she's posing for the photograph. Oh, yeah. yeah. And her smile fades mm, and just mm. turns into horror. It's so good. Yeah, Osgood was saying it's one of those moments. I was wondering about this. It's like, is she having some kind of, you know, like moment of precognition? Is it, you know, it's weird. It's like there's a sense of sadness or like resignation or yeah. kind of worry. It's it's really like all mixed up. But he's saying at any rate, it doesn't really matter. It's just rhythmically, you know, like where it falls in the movie. It's yeah. just perfect. Yep. You know, uh, we cut to, you know, Rose is in the bathroom, presumably trying to poop. <laughs> Uh, but she hears sounds, and so she she very cautiously walks out of the bathroom into this darkened hallway, which, oh my god, this hallway is just like, it's going to give me nightmares. Oh yeah, and the floor, which I'll come to in a minute, that kind of threw me off the red floor. Oh yeah. She she walks and looks out into the one of the exits, and they have like stairs leading out to one of the exits, and that's when she sees bloody bags. Like, mm. we saw cat grabbing some pillowcases earlier and she sees these bloody bags but we don't really see what's in it but this is enough to freak rose out and that's when boom cat runs out and fucking starts stabbing the shit out of her mm. oh my god dude and it's one of those long deaths too where you see her just shut her last shuddering breaths and everything yeah, she doesn't really, you know, she doesn't really finish the job. She just sort of waits for it to you. say, oh, I've done enough. I'm just going to bask and, <laughs> you know. And then she grabs her by the hair and lifts up her head and starts to go to work. So the cop, um, we don't know where Mr. Gordon is, but mm. uh, the cop has found uh, Kat back worshipping the furnace. But she's got some friends this time. <laughs> She's got the sister's heads and she's got Rose's head facing like like propped up and facing the uh 
the freaking uh, furnace and oh my god dude so good so freaking good and of course he she won't put the knife down and he shoots her in the shoulder there's a moment just before he shoots her <clears throat> i never noticed until yesterday i guess i don't know what this is accidental but where she raises her arms up you know like the devil horns yes saying hell satan oh my god that's <laughs> uh and I, I like when she uh i like when she flips him the bird <laughs> and says smell you later motherfucker <laughs> <laughs> But uh, we, we cut to uh, Linda and Bill driving Joan, a.k.a. Cat. Oh, my God. Cat has been Joan the whole time, y'all. <laughs> now, I understand that this is, this is a cheat. This is how you make a film and keep people guessing. Yeah. If you really want to, are these two storylines happening, happening at the same time? Or, uh, you know, what is this mystery? What is bill and linda and joan going what's going to happen when they get to the school when all this shit's yeah. going down and then as you watch this you realize that these these things are probably not happening at the same time and then of course it's revealed that emma roberts is playing the grown-up version of kieran and shipka mm. which hey i got it the first time not by guessing but by going Oh, she, that's that was Rose's parents. Oh, that's supposed to be Cat. Blah, 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 you know, and I know a lot of people came out of this movie going, "What? What? What was that? Yeah. I don't get it, it. it." It's weird. I think actually, my first viewing I was okay, and then I think either I was thinking about it after on my second viewing, I overthought it and then mm -hmm. got really confused, and yeah. then third viewing maybe, or even just after the second thinking again about it, it's like, oh shit, yeah, it all kind of clicked together yeah. perfectly. It's like, yeah, I'm a dope. You know? Well, you know, it's like one of those things. Like it's it's weird. They they tried to do a thing. They try to make it more of a, that's like the thriller aspect of this horror story. And in yeah. order to do that, they had to make a huge leap. And it, they require the audience to make this huge leap with them. And a lot of people, it's not going to work. Like, Lietta likes this movie, but she didn't get it until her second viewing that that was supposed to be Joan and Cat. And I'm like, yeah, it's it's crazy confusing. <laughs> it, it is fair enough. I mean, it's really, this is the right word, I'd say this film is really kind of elliptic, elliptically told, yeah, you know, yeah. in terms of how it's structured you know get not just the little flashes you know back of you know with cat and joan but just the how the structure like i said it's like a pretzel you know and things just go in uh from a better analogy you know going back and forth i mean case in point we just talked about that you know after the uh cop and the headmaster going in the house then yes. you know jumping way way back yep. you know like circling around again so they're driving along uh bill linda and joan and J linda's very upset Oh, can I just say, by the way, the okay. intro of the scene and the transition, uh, one of my favorite shots in the movie, this, like, this high following shot following the car where I think yeah. they mounted it on top of a truck. And especially because, and I'll come to, I've mentioned David Lynch a couple of times, and uh, Mulholland Drive, like I said, it's fresh in my brain, so I'd watched the 4K the night before. But mm. there is a shot that's almost identical. I think at the start where it's following the car, at the start of Mulholland Drive, that's almost identical to that. Uh, in the commentary, he says, you know where, um, oh God, sorry, my brain, um, Rose gets her introduction. Osgood says, yeah, people feel Twin Peaks when they watch this, maybe saying, oh, you know, she looks a bit like Audrey or something. Mm -hmm. But he, he says, you know, rightfully so, you know, on the comparison, you could not be more favorably compared and obviously welcomes <laughs> the comparison yes. to David Lynch, as you would. Dude, you know? try to get a screenshot of uh, the, the shots between oh, Black yeah, Coast yeah. Daughter and Mulholland Drive. That might be fun to see if you could uh, just get, get them side by side. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I see a lot of those on like Twitter and stuff. Don't I? It's, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I will and, make a note to do that. And that's one of my notes too, is talking about the, the Twin Peaks vibe I get from Rose. Mm, Very much mm. a, a Laura Palmer, Audrey kind of a situation. So. Definitely. Love definitely. it. Uh, but so, so Linda and Bill are driving Joan and, and she's, Linda's upset and she's like just grilling her husband like, do you tell people our daughter was murdered or not? Mm. Like, do, 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 you, can, do you even say it? They're kind of bickering back and forth and that's when... Our, our pal Joan cat decides to act and she says, I feel sick. I feel sick. Pull over. And he's like, okay, okay, I'll pull over. That's when Linda realizes where they are. Yeah. I think I only clicked this yesterday. Are they, she starts hiding her eyes. Are they right outside the school? Yep. Do we think? So yeah. yes, she, they're they're They were never going to Bramford. They were never going mm. to the school. Um, they were just going to drive by it because they're 
going to the next town yes, or even yeah. farther than that. And Jones, when she requested where they drop her off, it was going to be in the town right after Bramford. But as soon mm. as she is feeling sick, she's begging them to stop. Linda's begging him not to stop. Don't you dare stop here where our daughter was mm. killed. Poor guy stops. And that's when um, our pal cat uh, slash Joan had pocketed a knife from the restaurant. By the way, that knife was in to be washed. It was a dirty knife. Mm. going to be clean. So she couldn't even have a clean knife to kill these people. Oh, it she just makes it even worse. It? <laughs> she slices dad's throat, uh, Bill's throat, and then she freaking gets crazy stabby and just stabs freaking uh, Linda, Linda like 20 times. This movie is very stabby, isn't yeah. it? It has to be said. And then she praises Ralph again <laughs> in the back seat. And uh, there was a funny moment where uh, they filmed this scene and there, she was, uh, Emma Roberts was asking them, how'd I do? Did you guys think I was really thrown up? Did it sound like I was thrown up? And they're like, yes, <laughs> you sounded like you're actually puking. <laughs> so after she's done this, she starts to work on their, their heads. She starts to take their heads again. Where does the, um, blood splatter happen, by the way? That perfect, he says on the commentary, it's like a warrior or a shogun, like a stripe right down the center of her face. So that was, again, there was a lot of, uh, Ooh, yeah. you know, a serendip serendipity in this film, you know, and that was one bit, you know, they had one take, you know, it's not like, like, say, 40 below and all that. You, um, so the blood he's saying on James Remar's pants was like freezing instantly. Oh my God. So you get one shot crazy. of this, but it just, yeah, it just splattered perfectly. Yeah, I that I like to look. I'll look for that again. I, I she does get blood splattered on her face, but now I want to see how it looks this time. We cut back to our pal Cat when she's younger in the hospital, and the priest comes to see her, and realizes that she's possessed and is going to drive that demon out, y'all. And we have our exorcism scene, which I I'm very excited to talk about possession movies and exorcisms with you at the end of this. Uh, but yeah, he drives the demon out. He's successful. And the demon leaves, and as it's leaving, a cat looks at it longingly and says, Don't go! Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we cut back to our pal Cat in the future, slash, a.k.a. Joan, and she's taken the heads to the basement of the school, and the furnace is out. And she feels it, and it's cold. And yeah. she places, presumably she places the heads and tries to recreate her praising the demon from when she was younger. And the next thing you know, it's the dawn has come, and she's walking down this lonely road, unsuccessful in her attempts to reach the demon, and she just starts weeping, screaming, and boom, end of the movie. Whew. Yeah. Man. This is, you know what's funny, is I remembered falsely that there was a little hint that the demon talked to her. Mm. And I'm like, no, no, that's not this movie's bag. That's not that's not uh, our pal Osgood Perkins in this part of his career. <laughs> He's not going to give even our villain, <laughs> who's not really a villain. No. Know? I mean, obviously no. she's a fucking murderer. But uh, she was just so lonely and so ostracized for whatever reason. We never find out why or what she was like really before this demon took advantage of her and, and, and entered her body. But it was so bad being alone that she'd rather be inhabited by this demon than, you know, be alone. Yeah, I mean, you get the sense she was probably, I mean, obviously we, and it's never really spelled out, but we, we do have the heavy sense, obviously, that, you know, the her parents have died in this car crash. Like, so it's never spelled out, but yeah. he, I think it, the writing is kind of on the wall there. And you get the sense she's probably a bit of a loner as well. So just when they're gone, it's like there's nothing. Yeah. And, you know, so, you know, and um, yeah, obviously, you know, really pining for, for something, you know, to uh, sort of take the place. When at the end of the movie, the realization there is and i think this is another thing you said about the influence of this madeline book it was the i don't have the precise lane but that ends and basically says you know has this weird ending especially for what's meant to be a kid's book or i think the first one in the series is about her having her appendix taken out or something which is kind of odd and but it just ends and saying yeah there's nothing else and that the, this movie is again kind of like that but when she realizes that then she can finally you know finally grieve oh yeah god it's good Ooh. so before we wrap up and talk about like any more trivia we have or 
we talk about our little discussion point we're going to do. And, and, and of course, talk about whether or not we hate this boring movie, bro. I got some alternate titles. Oh, hit me. To The Black Coat's Daughter. Because the one thing about The Black Coat's Daughter is it's a clunky-ass title, <laughs> which is fine. That's fine. And I Am the Pretty Thing That Lives in the House is one of the clunkiest titles ever. Yeah. Um, and I just call it I'm a Little Peepy, Short and Stout. <laughs> I don't call it that. But here we go. So I'm going to do Lietta's first. I got Lietta contributed four of these. Uh, the first one is uh, The Bricklayer's Trowel. <laughs> uh, in keeping with that theme, uh, The Blacksmith's Hammer. Mm-hmm. And then <laughs> The Beer Maker's Kettle. And then she went a little off the rails here with the Bavarian Sausage Hawker. (laughs) Hey, we've known a few of those in our time, right, Simon? Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. I, oh, man. Uh, (laughs) I mean, what do I have? Uh, Oh, I don't know. It'd be like, I've already done like second, we're speaking to you, second cousin twice removed with whatever that was. (laughs) Petticoats cousin, second second cousin twice removed. (laughs) Uh, the smoking jackets, um, <laughs> like, <laughs> I don't know. I'm just looking at types of coat here and trying and scrambling, but I just can't. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> here are mine. The billionaire's borscht cauldron. Oh, show is that like that Russian, like soup or whatever yeah. it is. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Oh, uh, the know. braggart's dog walker. <laughs> the Katniss Everdeen's blogger. <laughs> Oh, right. I, think, yeah. I, know, I know what that is. I had to write that down. Uh, the Burgermeister's Cough Syrup. <laughs> uh, <Oof>. Yeah. <laughs> so that hurt a bit when I was laughing. Oh, you didn't hear it? No, no. I was just saying I, I got a slight pain while I was laughing, so that's a good sign. Um, okay. I, I like to hurt you. <laughs> <laughs> the Coal Miner's Bazinga. And, and last, and certainly most least, this one's for Simon. The Billy Goat's Bong Hit. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, perfect. No, I couldn't possibly follow any of that. This is what happens when you're an idiot and you have a pen and some paper. You're going to write some stupid shit down. And I'm very familiar with that feeling. So, did you have any other uh, trivia or you want to talk about with the film? Did you, or did we drop all those sweet little gems already? We got most of the kind of relevant stuff. I've been, you know, I'd read all my notes beforehand rather than, you know, trying to go through them line by line. So it's quite a lot. But yeah, and I, I would say, you know, anybody has the Blu-ray or if it's on the DVD, listen to the commentary. You know, there's probably yeah. more good stuff I'd either yes. written down or not, you know, to check out. Yeah, no, I think that'll do really. So we could go on and on with this. Like you say, it's a very rich, heady film. I, I am um, notoriously bad. I never listen to commentary tracks. This is like the most... I've skipped through. I'm. I, it's not that I just. I don't know why. I think I always want to just move on to the next film or move on to whatever mm-hmm. I'm watching next. And there's commentary tracks that I know are solid. And just from the little yeah. I've heard of this one, uh, is freaking uh, Oz Perkins is for as strange as he is, he's not really super pretentious. He seems to. He seems to know. <laughs> no, no. You know how how he is and how the story plays out, and is very aware of what he's doing. And he's so thankful to the crew and the cast for putting up with the conditions that they filmed this shit in, mm. which were terrible. Yeah. And he just is like, these people never complain to me. They work so hard. He's like, I don't even know what we were thinking. <laughs> but yeah, highly recommend that one. But uh, so Simon, how do you feel about the Black Coat's Daughter? Do you even like this like A24 crap? <laughs> Well, I can't speak for all of them. I was looking at looking at a list of the movies before. There were some I'd forgotten about, you know, like uh, The Killing of a Sacred Deer, just to name one. I've still never seen that. Oh, I'd highly recommend that. I love that movie. That that's, That is an odd one right there. But um, for this one, no, I uh, absolutely adore this movie. Um, it was recommended to me uh, by a friend of mine. I watched it uh, I think one Friday afternoon, like I did we watched it yesterday. And just, just straight away, you know, even before I'd got my head around all of the... Uh, the plot and you know all the subtext and the rest of it um and i get this with the other two movies as well just the the vibe and the atmosphere and like the lighting and just how deliberate and just detail kind of oriented and just perfect everything is and uh so sort of on that with the the vibe mood atmosphere what have you i love uh, it reminds me a bit of new Spiria, this you know the um i think i mentioned this we were talking about that the, you know everything's really it's very very wintry 
uh, of course, you oh, know, with yeah. snow, but just how kind of, <laughs> and like yesterday, it was, it was perfectly overcast for it. And, you know, just how just wonderfully drab and gray and everything is. And I sort of made a joke in my notes saying, were they trying to, in the school, like save on the lighting bill? But it was because, um, I was good enough, I think his DP is his Julie Kirkwood. I think it is. They had kind of a credo for this, which was just, just turn the lights off. Yeah. yeah, you know, pretty much, which is exactly what they did. <laughs> and he even apologized to the, the the lighting guy by name, like, "Oh yeah, sorry, dude. Like, if you had your lights on in this scene, I apologize, but <laughs> I'm pretty sure we just had the lights off for this shit." <laughs> yeah, but it's just it's, it's so spot on for it. It really, yeah, it just works beautifully. Well, you know, I love this movie so much that when I found out that uh, you enjoyed it as much as you did, mm. I was like, "Oh shit." Um, you need a copy of this. You did, yeah. I'd found a used copy that was in perfect shape because, of course, <laughs> I doubt the person who sold it even watched it. Mm. Um, I just immediately packed that up and shipped it to you and then bought myself the movie brand new so I'd have it. So you, we both have it because I suspected that one day we'd get around to it. No, eternally grateful for that. I, um, yeah, I rewatched the Blu-ray yesterday, and because I have a four K setup now, when you watch Blu-rays on it, it upscales it with the what do they call it, HDR, high dynamic range, and yeah, uh, especially for a movie like this with all that low lighting, it just, it just really, yeah, just yeah. Uh, nice, yeah, beautiful, beautiful. But uh, yeah, I love this one. This is my, if I'm gonna go ahead and just out myself here as an Osgood Perkins fan. Whoa, big shocker. <laughs> um, out of the three, it's the one I reach for least. So it's my third favorite of the, the horror movies he's done to date. You know, Gretel and Hansel and I Am the Pretty Thing Lives in the House. But this is intense. It's brooding. It's fucking gorgeously shot. It's crushingly sad. I mean, this mm -hmm. is one of the mm -hmm. most sad. Not, I don't know if it's depressing. I mean, maybe if I was in a crappy mood, I wouldn't <laughs> be thrilled to watch this. Uh, but it's scarier than I remembered it. Yeah, yeah. Like I said, I think I used the word kind of disquieting before for a lot of it, you know, before a lot of things could kick off. It really, and because I had, and it, it tends to peak my anxiety so often mid-afternoon. So when I was watching this, it was <laughs> it was kind of perfect. I was getting very creeped out, you know, in the best way. But no, like you, you say, it made me think of going back to the Twin Peaks, David Lynch, Comparison you said when we talked Firewalk with me, you know, the ending, it's all this megaton bomb of emotion just kind of going off at the end, and it re really does. And, and of course, the music score by Elvis Perkins is very much a huge part of this, and very unsettling music as well. It's so perfect, and so, as Osgood says, you know, rightfully so, and just so kind of unique, really. I think it, this was his first score, and he said in an interview somewhere, I think with this and I Am The Pretty Thing That Lives In The House as well, it kind of, you know, to be restrictive, this is a guy who's, you know, he described him as a, as a poet, you know, um, it kind of kill, almost killed him, you know, to be restricted in this way, to say you have to do this here or do that, you know. But it, their, their collaborations, you know, are just, oh, it's just like a match made in heaven, really. And that's it only gets better with mm. uh, I Am The Pretty Thing because oh, it, yeah. that yeah. is... The sound design plus the music is – that's like 90% of that film mm, right there. Mm. So I know from our discussions before we started recording that you had a question, a, a, a Simonicity question time, totally not like a Brad question time question. <laughs> yeah, I even uh, – I said to Brad, it's like I'm, you know – and I was sort of half asked him, but half not really as well, saying, you know, I'm, I'm hijacking question time. So, uh, but I said to him, it's only polite if I let him answer this first. So, um, I'll give you his answer. Okay. So, the question was anyway, what is some of your favorite winter horror films? And I'll let you kind oh, of wow. percolate on that for a minute. But he said to me, he gave me two answers. Let me see. He says, yeah, um, Ghost Story and Black Christmas. And on Black Christmas, what did he say further down? Um, Black Christmas sort of more of a Christmas film than a winter film, um, which I, I said to him, yeah, I, I could see it either way. I think the first time I saw Black Christmas was not even at Christmas. And it is, is as much as it's a Christmas movie, it's a perfect winter horror film. I mean, it yes. is literally just bone chilling, you know, even after after countless viewings. Yeah, so I've written down a few. Like I said, I don't want to, you know, go off on, uh, you know, spend ages talking about this. But I'm just curious from yours, just even off the top of your head, and then I'll tell you some I've written down. Well, I, of course, blanked completely. I oh, probably should have. I should have done, because you gave me the chance 
to uh, to have time to think about the question. I said, no way, dude. I got this. If you like, quickly I can read you my list, which I've written down. Oh, no, I'm, I'm ready. I got this. Okay, go I got for this. it. We'll, we'll let you steal the, 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 the spotlight and frickin' go out with a blaze of snow-covered glory or <laughs> Parmesan cheese. <laughs> yes. Obviously, The Shining um, yes. is, is a big one for me. Uh, that's you know a film from my youth that has, has never stopped giving. Mm. It's just such a fantastic freaking thing. Um, you know, The Thing, to a lesser extent, I, I I do love The Thing. That's another movie I probably watched when I was way too young. But it's not, like, what really jumped out as I was kind of, like, flipping through these titles here. So here's some that just really, like, oh, baby. Cold Prey. Yes. The, the, the slashers, the one and two. I've been dying to rewatch those. It has been so long um, that I kind of reminded Lietta that they existed while we were looking for winter films to watch, and we didn't jump and watch those. We should have. Yeah, and no, I'm years overdue for rewatch. I've still not seen the sequels, I must say. The second one is fantastic. I don't know what mm. the third one. I have no idea about the third one, but yes. Uh, Ghost Keeper. Yes. Is, is one that we watch a lot now. I, I remember um, Brad. <laughs> Brad, I don't think he remembers saying this to me, but he, like, basically gave me the impression that Ghost Keeper was bad and he never mm. wanted to see it again. And when I told him I was watching it, he's like, okay. I was like, but dude, I'm watching. He's like, uh-huh. <laughs> and he didn't realize that he'd sort of told me not to. <laughs> not explicitly. But then I was, I was texting him like how much I loved it. And he's like, oh, yeah. And I'm like, okay, dude, do you remember saying how bad it was? He's like, no. I'm like, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Maybe I dreamed it. Maybe he dreamed it, but yeah, Ghost Keeper, woo, man, it's and it's so cold in that movie. Yeah. It is so cold. Those people are freaking like working those calf muscles, trying to walk through that snow, working, I'm probably working their entire freaking torso, trying to move through that snow. Boy, <laughs> so cold. Um, of course, Krampus. I'm a big fan of Krampus. Mm. And uh, do to do, do Crimson Peak, yes, that snow. Oh my god, it's so good! And um, one that I honestly would not have thought of, but of course, Google is very helpful. Um, although I don't think it has a lot of rewatchability, Pontypool, yes, yes, I've still only seen that once, but yeah. Yeah, that's why I, I I would have not thought to put on the list. And I'm the more I think about them, I'm like, holy shit. Mm. Uh, last one that I'll throw out there, and it's one I do not watch enough. Good lord, freaking um, curtains. Yes, curtains is so good, and I've had that Blu-ray forever, and I've still only ever watched the bootleg. I'm so dumb. Oh man, you're a treat. But yeah, those are mine. Um, I see. I thought your question was gonna be about um possession movies oh right yeah well and i wanted to say one quick thing about black coat's daughter before you reel off your list no go for it i am so sick of possession movies now <laughs> i'm not sick of exorcist ripoffs especially italian and spanish exorcist ripoffs from the 70s but a possession movie has to be so weird mm. and so different for me to get into it which is why over at the the uh, Dark Parade podcast with Bo. Oh, yeah. I know what you're going to say. Yeah. He and I talked about one of the most obtuse uh, possession films ever made, um, which was freaking Lose from uh, 2018. Oh, man. Yeah. Love it. I went into that not knowing what the plot was and going, oh, afterwards, like, yeah, it makes sense. That would make for a really great double bill with this. Now no, I think about <laughs> Dude. it. That I am inspired. I will do that someday. That's great. Fantastic. Okay, dude. I thank you for letting me play a little tangent there. What are your favorite winter horror films? Well, before that, I will say, just reminding me, I had a bit of a um, left field double bill last night. You know, possession movies because I had the um, 4K UHD of Demons 2 to watch. So I watched that last night. Oh, dude. That's so good. 
Which, yeah, like I say, couldn't be more radically different, but there is that, you know, that tenuous sort of thematic connection, I suppose. I upgraded to that Blu-ray. I should really fire that up. Oh, my God. Oh, yeah. It looks great. Um, so, yeah, mine. So, the first two I wrote on this, um, and this from me, I, for a few years, I used to watch these as a double bill in winter. I'm not for a while, I think, just because my attention span has been a bit destroyed. So, often now, it's more rare I will have double features. But, yeah, The Thing and The Shining are not just the winter horror film. The winter horror double feature to be but kind of you know an 80s or even horror double feature to be of all time for me i mean i will put that against any fucking double feature anybody's got it's just uh yeah just perfect um i have new Speria, of course oh boy yes we mentioned before um the witches which that has a bit of wantonness at the start but not yeah. you know really um sort of um Oh, next, something I've only seen twice, got the 4K out, but I need to rewatch sometime soon. Make a good double feature with The Shining, actually, you know, Abandoned Hotel in the off-season. Uh, Daughters of Darkness. Yes, oh my god, yes. I have, you have Curtains and Ghostkeeper, love them. Uh, yeah, Ghostkeeper, yes. well, but yeah, both of them, but Ghostkeeper, that's what I think I found on Amazon Prime in a good print and just, yeah, fell in love with straight away um something i rewatched recently she's more the winter of the star but the whole thing this feels perfect this time of year is the changeling nice of course something which again only really has the snow at the start but uh and it's more so i think it's set around halloween actually but the house of the devil so some of these are kind of tenuous um something oh, i really need to rewatch soon related to what brad said about black christmas uh the sleeper yes <laughs> nice I think you said Crimson Peak. Yeah, I would wholeheartedly agree with that Absolutely. one. Yeah. And a few at the bottom, which I really need to rewatch. You said about Cold Prey. Yeah, years overdue for rewatching that. Uh, Let the Right One In. Ditto even more so. Probably not seeing that the part, best part of 10 years, I think. And uh, Pondpool as well. So there's probably more, but that's, like you say, it was just sort of off the top of my head, you know. Oh, I, I Dead of Winter is one I... I... Oh, yeah, totally I've was seen that. thinking about while you're talking. Yeah, that's one of those movies that I rented when I was really young, mm. and it ended up blowing my mind because it's it's one of those movies that hey, at least when you're you know eleven or twelve, it makes you feel really smart. Mm. It's one of those twisty, twisty, twisty movies where the twists just keep on coming. And it's it's really satisfying. I think you'd really enjoy it. Yeah, I feel like we mentioned this in passing before. I don't know. Uh, yeah, 1987. I think we covered and somebody had worked on it. Oh, right. I remember now. Yeah, Richard, the guy did the music. Uh, I forget what the episode we were talking about. Was it Richard Einhorn? Now it's all coming back together. And Mary Steenburgen. <laughs> well, she wasn't in the thing we talked about. But yeah, I'm just getting vague <laughs> echoes of uh, past recordings. Speaking of horns. <laughs> Whoa. Dude, I think we did it. I think we recorded an episode for yeah. the first time in a really long time. Oh, yeah. we did, Hopefully yeah. we made this as long <laughs> long enough to be the audio commentary. So when, when enough, Screen yeah, Factory just, re-releases yeah. this, they're going to be calling us like, yo, <laughs> we need Simonicity. Oh, yeah, they do. Awesome. Well, dude, thank you for hanging out. Oh, always a pleasure. And folks, thank you for listening. We promise we'll be back. And eventually we're going to come back to the Osgood Perkins. And uh, mm. but I think we've got a little bit of a a giallo picked out. Yeah, and I'm gonna go ahead and usually I don't announce what you and I plan to do next, but I want to give people time to find this movie because I don't mm. know how mm. easy it is to find this film. Yeah, I don't think, especially like uh, on you know either side of uh, the pond for us, there really is one. It may be like an Italian import or something, or maybe even bootlegs. Yeah, I hey, can't remember beg, now. borrow, and steal. Um, at the time of this recording, um, it is up on uh, Giallo Realm on YouTube, and it's a nice copy. Oh, on YouTube, but yeah. I'm talking, of course, about uh, 1986, Lambava's... The Mo Lambava, Mo Beta. You'll Die at Midnight, a.k.a. Midnight Killer. Yes. Uh, what is the freaking Italian title? More, uh, more... Oh, my God, I don't know if I've ever seen this word before. Morari... Ah, Mezzanote. That's a new one for me. Uh, just look for the one where the girl's uh, going against the killer. The killer has a bloody butcher knife, and she has a freaking uh, hand mixer. <laughs> <laughs> That's messed up. That's a messed oh, up scene. Dude. 
Was this also called the Midnight Ripper or something? Yeah, Midnight Ripper. Midnight yeah. Ripper, yeah. I heard Midnight, Midnight Killer One as well. One of my favorites is Carol Will Die at Midnight. So, yeah. <laughs> um, and I think, you know, we'll get back to Osgood Perkins specifically with I Am the Pretty Thing That Lives in the House, mm. which is, oh, spoiler God. alert, a movie I have to fucking fight for all the time. Oh, we'll fight everybody, don't you worry. I'll use the U word. I will use the U word over and over again. <laughs> Underrated underrated <laughs> this film is underrated hey you know what's underrated this film oh man just uh <laughs> how can you like change your voice and i got a bit of uh i think you just asmr'd me <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a short take <laughs> bye folks good night This is The Doom Show is a proud member of the Legion Podcast Network. Please check out the other podcasts on legionpodcasts.com. If you'd like more Hello, This is The Doom Show, go to hellodoomshow.podomatic.com or go to doomedmoviethon.com for the archives. If that's still not enough, go to at doomedmoviethon on Twitter. You can write in to Hello, This is the Doom Show. Use the email doomedmoviethon at gmail.com. Doom Show episodes are available on record and 8-track cassette.